If I said the name August Wilson, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? A storyteller. He was always looking and listening. It was about these otherwise undocumented lives and these otherwise unheard voices. He finds the poetry in everyday life and sings to it. Prophet, truth teller, an amazing visionary. He was a distiller of the black experience. That was an excerpt from August Wilson, The Ground on Which I Stand, a documentary directed by Sam Pollard as part of the PBS series American Masters. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Tony and Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright August Wilson has been called America's Shakespeare. His monumental achievement is his century or Pittsburgh cycle of 10 plays, one set in each decade of the 20th century. Nine of the plays are set in Pittsburgh's Hill District, the African-American neighborhood where Wilson was raised. Individually, the plays like Fences, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, The Piano Lesson, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, are powerful pieces of theater that give voice to ordinary African-Americans in their struggles and their joys. But the plays together are an extraordinary theatrical and cultural event. Wilson gave us the arc of black life in Pittsburgh through the 20th century. By hearing the poetry in the language of people at the barbershop on the street corner in the diner and bringing it to the stage, Wilson showed us a people rarely seen, let alone celebrated. White folks don't understand about the blues. They hear it come out, but they don't know how it got there. They don't understand it's life's way of talking. You don't sing to feel better. You sing because that's a way of understanding life. The blues help you get out of bed in the morning. You get up knowing you ain't alone. There's something else in the world. Something's been added by that song. This be an empty world without the blues. I take that emptiness and I try to fill it up with something. It's our good fortune that Sam Pollard has directed the documentary of Wilson's life and work, The Ground on Which I Stand. An accomplished filmmaker, Pollard has won numerous Emmy, Peabody, and Polk Awards. And just as significantly, for the last 40 years, he's been editing, producing, and directing films about the African-American experience. He's worked as an editor, most notably with Spike Lee, on films like Mo' Better Blues, Jungle Fever, Four Little Girls, and When the Levees Broke. As a director, his films have included Eyes on the Prize 2, Slavery by Another Name, and Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? When I spoke with Sam Pollard, I was curious about the profound impact that August Wilson's Pittsburgh neighborhood had on his work. You know, it's amazing how every creative artist sort of the wellspring of their artistic work comes from where they come from. And for August, growing up in Pittsburgh in the Hill District in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, it really was the fuel for his work, you know. So I had an opportunity to go back to Pittsburgh and to the Hill District two or three times before we started shooting. I was given a tour of the Hill District by a historian who's in the film, and he gave me a sense of all the different places that August used to hang out out, to hang out at the diner, the Jitney Station. And, you know, he would tell us the stories about how August would spend his days sitting in the diner or sitting in, in the Jitney Station just writing, just writing. I was talking to um, the husband of Daryl Ford Williams, who's one of the co-executive producers from WQED, a week and a half ago. And he grew up in the Hill District, and he, he knew August slightly. And his recollection said he remembered that a lot of people thought August was an odd duck. You know, he didn't seem like one of the regular guys, you know, because he was always sitting in some booth in a diner, in Eddie's diner, writing, 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 writing. And they didn't know what to make of him. But what he was doing was he was gathering the, the tools. He was gathering the stories that were going to help him shape the plays that he wanted to tell. And so the, the Hill District and growing up with his community, growing up with his mother and his siblings, was very impactful, you know, in nurturing August's work. And so we knew that it was important that people understood the wellspring from which he came. And you certainly succeeded in that. August Wilson began as a poet, 
But what do you think inspired him to pick up a pen in the first place? I think I think you know he was a poet and he and he wrote some wonderful poetry. He even continued to write poetry even after he became a successful playwright. And his widow Costanza, at some point, wants to have a collection published of his poetry. But I think that because he was also informed by the Black Arts Movement and the Black Panther Party and the you know what was going on in the '60s, he wanted to be able to have people hear what he had to say. And I think he understood that it wasn't just going to be be able to do it through poetry. He needed to do it through the plays. And so he started directing and he started writing little one acts and stuff in Pittsburgh as he began this sort of journey to go from poet to playwright. And he really didn't really sort of find his voice or find his direction till he left Pittsburgh and went to St. Paul and then got involved with the Penumbra Theater there. And that's where he really started to flower, because then he was able to take everything he had inside of him, all the stuff he'd heard, all the language he had heard from the people in the community in the Hill District, and then was able to sort of put it down on paper and shape the plays that eventually would become this this large body of work. Part of that learning for him was really learning to trust the authentic voices and not trying to reshape them or or make them into something else. That's exactly right. He had to learn to trust the voices that he heard in the community. He had to learn to trust the fact that what those people were saying, when you really pay attention to it, it's vital, it's got depth, it's got deeper meaning than what you think it might have when you first hear it. And he learned to hear that and understand that. And he says, as you heard in the film, he says that as some of the critics say, he's really started to understand and hear the voices when he left Pittsburgh and was in St. Paul. So he needed a little distance to be able to say, ah, now I think I found the language. I hear the language. I'll use that phrase. I hear the language. And I can use it effectively now in the, the shaping of my place. And it was his great good fortune, and our good fortune, that he met Lloyd Richards. Can you just give us a little bit of background about Lloyd Richards and then the profundity of that relationship? Well, you know, it was a tremendous great fortune, good fortune for August to meet Lloyd. And Lloyd, as we all know, those who know history, the you know, black history, black arts history, Lloyd made a real name for himself in 1959, 58, 59, when he did Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun. And he was considered the premier African-American director of his time. Originally, Ma Rainey was two one acts. August sent his two one acts to the Yale Repertory Company, and they looked at it, and Lloyd looked at it. And Lloyd, as Lloyd says in the film, he knew those people. He knew those people who talked in the barbershop. He knew those people. He knew that he had found, and he was reading an original voice. And he's helped and shaped and guided August through his first six plays in helping to edit and refine his work and get it out there and give it shape and give it an arc. As a lot of the actors say in the film, Lloyd Richards was someone they just felt great esteem for. He had, as Steve McKinley Anderson says, he had a Socratic method. He never told them what to do. He listened to what they were doing, and he let them find the way, which was the sign of a really wonderfully creative director who knew how to get the best out of the actors who worked in those plays and how to make sure they understood the language, August's language. I mean, as Dutton says in the film, if it wasn't for Lloyd Richards, there would not have been an August Wilson or a Charles Dutton because he really made those two guys shine when Ma Rainey came out. Well, I think the thing with Lloyd Richards that's so remarkable, aside from what a fantastic director he was, he was also such a nurturer of talent. Oh, he absolutely was. In my experience, in in my long career, I've had a few people who were really strong nurturers of my latent talent. And, And if it wasn't for them nurturing me and pushing me, I wouldn't be talking to you today. And Lloyd was the same way. He could see that there was something there on the page in August's work that needed nurturing, that needed refining, that needed someone to, someone who could mentor him, and he was the person. You structured the documentary around August Wilson's spectacular 10-play cycle. Yeah, you know, we felt when we, when we structured this that it wasn't so much just to give you a biography of his life, but also give you some insight into every play that he did and where they were coming from. And since 
he at some point around the fourth play decided he wanted to create a play for every decade. We felt we needed to honor that also, that every one of these plays was going to look at every decade in America and the African-American experience. So even though the order is different than actually than how the plays were produced and delivered, he did. He covered every decade. But what we were trying to do with every play, say, this is an element here in this play that you need to look at. So, for example, in Joe Turner, we want to look at that sense of spirituality and community. You know, in Fences, we want to look at the tension between a generation of African-Americans who were already in the North and those who were coming from the South looking to make their lives better. In Two Trains Running, we were looking at the fact that the impact of people like Malcolm X was having on the community in some ways dividing the, the, the African-American community in terms of where they wanted to be, but either going toward Malcolm X or going toward Dr. King. In King Headley, we're looking at the impact of a black man who's struggling with being someone who just came out of prison and trying to figure out how to make a living and have a family. So every one of these plays deals with different aspects of the community, but they also deal with the aspects of mother and daughter relationships, husband and wives relationships, father and son relationships. As long as you live in my house, you put a sir on the end of it when you talk to me. Yes, sir. You eat every day. Yes, sir. Got a roof over your head. Yes, sir. And clothes on your back. Yes, sir. Why do you think that is? Because of you. Hell, I know it's because of me. Why do you think that is? Because you like me. Like you. I go out of here every morning and bust my butt putting up with them crackers all day long because I like you. You is the biggest fool I ever saw. It is my job. It is my responsibility. You understand that? A man got to take care of his family. You live in my house. You sleep your behind on my bedclothes. You put my food in your belly because you are my son. You are my flesh and blood, not because I like you. It is my duty to take care of you. I owe a responsibility to you. Wait now. Let's get this straight right now. We'll go along any further. I ain't got to like you. Mr. Rand, don't give me my money come payday because he liked me. He give me because he owe me. Now, I didn't give you everything I had to give you. I gave you your life. Your mama and me worked it out between us. And liking your black ass was not a part of the bargain. And don't you try and go through life worried if somebody like you or not. You best make sure that they are doing right by you. You understand what I'm saying, boy? Yes, sir. And a lot of these plays, even though they focus in the African-American community, they have a universal perspective. They most certainly do. Well, that's the beauty of art. It's almost as though the more specific you are about a particular place, particular people, the more universal that message can become. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was, that's what August was about. His plays were not only looking at the African-American experience, but looking at the human condition the human condition. And it's an amazing kind of thing to think that a man could see that and document that and create characters and situations that speak to that. And characters that are so different. Everyone. Everyone. And he wasn't making characters that were either good or bad. He was creating characters from King Headley to Charles Dutton's character in Ma Rainey to Felicia Rashad in Jim of the Ocean. He's creating characters who have sort of a complex, like all of us do, has a complex relationship with everyday life. I think it was Lawrence Fishburne in your documentary who said what Wilson was doing was really showing the frustration and the glory of everyday African-American life. There was a real celebratory aspect to his work, but at the same time, no one could ever in a million years say he was blind to what the challenges were. Absolutely right. He wasn't. This man, his eyes were open. He could see. He he was in tune with, with the world around him. He was always in tune. When I recorded Wynton Marsalis doing the performance of Danny Boy that he played at, at August's funeral, Before we started recording, he was telling me a story about how him and August sometimes would walk from 59th Street all the way up to Harlem and just talk about the social and political aspects of what was going on at the time. time. So this guy was in tune. He was in tune 
with what was happening in the world, what was happening in America, what was happening to black people. And he was pretty fierce about protecting African-American culture, wanting African-American theaters to thrive. He really was very pointed about that, wanting a director, an African-American director for the film Offenses, for example. When he had all of this clout, being a very successful Broadway playwright, he knew it gave him an opportunity to speak up and speak out about the disenfranchisement of other African-American playwrights and plays and African-American theaters, and that needed to be addressed. He said that he wanted an African-American director, but, you know, he also knew that if that could happen, he could also live with the fact because there were some productions of some of his plays in other countries with white directors or Asian directors, but he wanted to make sure that first and foremost, if one of his plays was going to be done or documented, or Fences was to be made into a film, it should be done by an African-American because they would be able to understand and speak to the experience that they would that you would see in a play. When you reached out to actors like Viola Davis or Charles Dutton, Lawrence Fishburne, I mean, I can go on at James Earl Jones, their emotional appreciation of Wilson, as well as their intellectual appreciation of Wilson, was very striking to me. They were all so clear about the history the history that he was a part of and that he was pushing forward and the legacy that he left and the gifts that he gave actors with those plays and those characters. Yeah, you know, that's what's, I think that's one of the most striking things about doing this particular project, that in sitting with all of these wonderful actors, they, as you just said so concisely, was that they were able to articulate both from an intellectual and an emotional perspective, how important it was to be in an August Wilson play, how important it was to interact with August, how important it was to see always the big picture that August's plays were delving into and dealing with. And it made them feel that the work they were doing that was important and gratifying and challenging. You know, Felicia Rashad said that every time she did on Esther, she was challenged to see where she could find the other nuances every time she read those same lines. I know about the water. The water has its secrets, the way the land has its secrets. There's some that know about the land and some that know about the water, but there's some that know about the land and the water. They got both sides of it. Take a look at this map here. You see that right there? That's a city. It's only a half a mile by a half a mile, but that's a city. It's made of bones, pearly white bones. All the buildings and everything made of bones. I seen it. I've been there, Mr. Citizen. My mother lived there. I got an aunt and three uncles lived down there in that city made of bones. You want to go there, Mr. Citizen? I could take you there if you want to go. That is the center of the world. In time, it will all come to light. The people made a kingdom out of nothing. They were the people that didn't make it cross the ocean. So she understood you were reading the same lines all the time, but every time she went out on stage and, and she delivered those lines, there was other ways to create the, the most the emotions and the nuances that were in, deeply embedded in that in that language. There was not one actor who didn't feel that working in an August Wilson play was one of the highest honors in their career. What attracted you to filmmaking? Oh, you know, I was attracted to filmmaking. As a young man, when I was a t young 14, 12-year-old, I just liked watching movies. I loved watching films. I just enjoyed watching movies all the time. And it was, at that time, just traditional Hollywood films. Never thinking that I would get into the film business, but I just liked watching movies. And then in my early 20s, when I was given an opportunity to get involved in a film and television workshop that had been started in 1968 by WNET, the public television station, they had this one-year workshop to get more people of color behind the camera in the editing room. I was persuaded to join this program, and uh, initially reluctant, 
But in retrospect, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And you began as an editor. Why editing? Well, I began as an apprentice editor and wanted to be an editor because, in all honesty, everything else about filmmaking frightened me. I was very uncomfortable at being on location. I was uncomfortable at being given a task of being an assistant cameraman. I didn't talk a lot in those early years. I was very shy. And I felt the most comfortable when I was in that secluded, dark room editing, making mistakes that nobody could see that I could remedy by just changing a splice. So I felt comfortable there. So that was like the goal. Let me be an editor because I can work in isolation. I can create. And nobody will be able to see me until I want want them to see what I've done. Were there films that you saw when you were younger that had a great impact on you? The film, and I and I say this quite readily, the film that has had the most impact on me from when I was a young man to today is Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. And it, the impact is many-fold. It's the way it sounds. It's the way it's edited. It's the way it's acted. It's the way it's shot. It's the structure of it, starting with Charles Foster Kane dying, his last breath being Rosebud. That film probably touched me more than any film I ever seen. And many of the films, when I, even when I was an editor and I edited a film about Langston Hughes, I've been so influenced by Citizen Kane. I wanted to start. The, I did start the film with with, with Langston Hughes dying. Uh. <laughs> 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 and I've tried to do that anytime I do a biography film. Kill them off at the beginning and bring them back, like Wells did. You've been a director, a writer, an editor, and film is such a collaborative process. Can you just help me a little bit in differentiating those roles? And is it easy to move from one into the other since you've been a director when you're an editor? Do you find that you want to direct a little bit, or is it just somebody else's issue to deal with? I've been very fortunate, you know, since 1988 when I was a producer-director on Eyes on the Prize too, And that initial transition from editor to director was a frightening one, and I was scared. I was afraid that I was going to fail, and I almost did fail, but I didn't succeed it. So since that time, I have embraced the idea that every year I'll edit the film, then maybe the next year I'll direct the film, then maybe the next year I'll edit the film— I like the going back and forth. I like the idea of being able to still edit for someone else and not feel like, oh, I should have really directed this. No, when I edit, I edit. And when I direct, I direct. So when I have an opportunity to direct and there's a budget, I never edit those films. I always hire someone else. And the important thing to remember about filmmaking is you, you mentioned this. It's a collaborative process. And no man is an island when you make a film. Everybody needs a group of collaborators to make this film happen. And... Uh, if you're fortunate enough to get the right collaborators and you get the right material and you work hard enough, maybe you can make a film that's pretty respectable. You need everybody to make a film. You need people who are dedicated to the project and to the, to the idea that we're trying to do good work. Now, you move between documentary films and feature films. You're, yeah. You mostly are an editor, I think, with feature films. Yes. Um, and you've worked a lot with Spike Lee. How did you and Spike Lee first hook up? It was 1988. I was in the middle of editing on Eyes on the Prize. I was living in Boston, and one day Spike called my apartment, and my 10-year-old son, Jason Pollard, answered the phone, and he said, Dad, Spike Lee is on the phone. And I initially said, Jason, you must be pulling my leg because I had just seen Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. But he said, no, Dad, it's Spike Lee. So I got on the phone, and it was Spike, and he offered me a job to edit his film that became, it was originally called A Love Supreme, and it became Mo Better Blues with Denzel Washington and Wesley Snipes. And that was our first collaboration, and then I went on and edited, as you know, Jungle Fever and Clockers and Bamboozled and worked on Inside Man. And then we did the uh, documentary Four Little Girls and when the levees broke. And so, you know, it's been a, it was a long, a long collaboration over 20 years. Now, let me ask you this. When you're editing a documentary, it would seem like there's a different set of challenges on you than when you're editing a feature film. There is. The big challenge, this is the major challenge. The major challenge with editing documentary is that you have no script, there's no actors, and there's no sense of sometimes where the story is going to begin and where, is it going to, where it's going to end. With a feature film, you have a script, you have actors, you have scenes, you have a script that usually, unless 
it's a really rushed production. You know where it starts, and you hopefully know where it's going to end. Now, it doesn't mean it won't change after you've edited the, the first cut of the film and you screen it in a screening room with the director and some producers, but you do have a, a, a template there. So the challenge with the documentary is to take usually lots of footage, sometimes the interview, sometimes verite footage, and to give it rhyme or reason in the structure. And I, people always ask me the question, where do I prefer editing, features or documentaries? And I can always say unequivocally documentaries, and the reason is because when I began as a documentary editor, being trained by this gentleman, Victor Konevsky, I found it was an exhilarating, frustrating, exciting, scary challenge to be able to take footage that may not have had, had rhyme or reason and make a story out of it. I love that challenge. Sometimes I, I was successful at it. Sometimes I failed at it. But I always love the challenge. I love coming back to it. So that's why I love editing doc so much. But that's the difference between editing a documentary and editing a feature. Always. It's all about story, isn't it? It always comes back to story. Always about story. Storytelling is, a, is, is the component for all of these this approach to filmmaking. You know, you've spent a long time with August Wilson. I, I have a two-part question. First, is it hard to let go and put it to bed? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's never hard for me because because for me, you know, every project, every time you create something, you reach a point of no return where you get to the point where you say, I think I've done everything I can do with it. Now it's time to give it birth and let it go and let people respond to it. So for me, every film, there's always a, a point where I know that it's over. So it wasn't hard for me to let go at all. And the second question is, you came in obviously knowing about August Wilson, but you also, I'm sure, learned a lot more. Was there anything that was unexpected in what you found out about him? You know, I think, I think the biggest thing that I didn't know which I really got to know, was the, the very complicated relationship between August and Lloyd. That was one thing I learned. The second thing I, I, I think I came away with understanding in a deeper way than I might have thought I knew about was that even though August wasn't a religious man, he was a very spiritual man. And he infused all his work, particularly Joe Turner and Jim in the Ocean, with a level of spirituality that you can't walk away from. It just grabs you, grabs you by the throat. So those those two things are the things that I think that I came away, away with feeling that, wow, this is a way another way of looking at this, this phenomenal playwright. That was Sam Pollard. He directed the documentary August Wilson, The Ground on Which I Stand. It's part of the series American Masters and premieres on February 20th at 9 p.m. on PBS. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.